Hello, and welcome to the teacher edition of Steve Barkley Ponders Out Loud. The complexity of teaching is both challenging and rewarding, and my curiosity is piqued whenever I explore with teachers the multiple pathways for facilitating student engagement in the exciting world of learning. This podcast looks to serve teachers as they motivate and support their learners. Thanks for listening. I'm delighted that you're here. Teaching, Learning, and Technology. Many educators in New Zealand have had the opportunity to learn through the work of our guest today, Frances Valentine. She's the founder of the Mind Lab and the Tech Futures Lab, and the author of a new book that I'm in the middle of reading and I'd recommend it to you, Future You. Welcome, Frances. Hi, Steve. Great to be here. Francis, I'm wondering if you'd start by telling us some of the things that educators who work with you are learning and applying. So the main focus of the teachers we work with are doing postgraduate studies with us, most of them in the latter stages of their career. So the average teacher in New Zealand is 55 and female, very similar to in the US, and they haven't really had formal education for somewhere between 20 and 30 years. So the piece that they find the most intimidating is digital, the whole digital revolution and technology. So our focus is around leadership and digital. And so what we've found is if you bring those two together and build confidence with teachers and actually enable them to realize they don't have to be the expert, that actually all they have to do is facilitate then actually the whole teaching pedagogy can completely change and they can really focus on the learning outcomes using technology or using the tools that young people love to use. My read, having been in this uh, field for uh, a lot of years, is that one of the things technology did in many cases was open the door for teacher and learner to do some role switching. (laughs) So in yeah. many cases, technology uh, allowed the teacher to step back and the, the student who frequently was uh, ahead on some of the technologies from their teachers, the teachers who were comfortable switching roles had a, a great opportunity that in many ways advanced the student's interest. Yeah, and if I look at one of our key programs that we deliver, the first session that we have, we have if we have teachers on site in person, is we start off by saying there is no instructions in our lessons. So actually, we are going to be talking about things, to, problems to solve and opportunities to learn. And so if you imagine you're in a class with 30 people and you'll say, we we're going to make a hovercraft. And then you say, here, here are the things that we have at our disposal and you have a whole bunch of things in front of you. And it's like, okay, so the, the competition, you always want a competition with teachers. Though, you know, We all like the, the healthy competition is, is to get self-forming teams. So you can be a, a two-person team or a 10-person team, doesn't matter. But it's the first person who can get a, one of these sort of paper plates to hover. Go for it. Now, it's so interesting when you see teachers, they look and say, are you crazy? Like, how are we going to get a, a plate to hover? Like, what is this? And of course, you'll have enough people in the class who go, hang on, I know the basic scientific principles of how how you might get a paper plate to hover off the ground and let's see what we have. And, oh, look, there's some little motors here and there's a little bit of, oh, there's some batteries. And then there's, and actually within about 10 minutes, there's this hive of activity, like everybody and everyone's looking at each other, like who's winning the race. Within about 30 minutes, you start getting people for the first prototypes. They're starting to test things and, you know, is it working? And no, that's not working. So they're they're iterating and they're changing. And then eventually someone cracks it and someone goes, woo, you know, the the plate is hovering. Now they've had no instructions, but they've had a massive learning opportunity. They've built confidence. They've collaborated. They've laughed. And actually there's a lot of learning. It's at that moment. And the reason we do it on the very first day, and it may not be a hovering plate, it might be a solar car or something similar, is it reminds them, what it feels like to be a student. And then there's this recognition of, gosh, well, when's the last time my classroom was that much of a high of activity and productivity and laughter? And and then sometimes they realize that actually when you're actively involved and you don't have all the answers and you have to figure it out, there's a massive learning opportunity that can be incredibly enjoyable. And 
you know, for the teachers who are bold enough to reflect, you'll often hear them say, it's like, well, I don't think I've heard that level of laughter and enjoyment and learning for a long time in my classroom. And then, and then we sort of turn around saying, well, let's make that a normal process of let's make sure that your classroom, that you can help facilitate learning. It doesn't matter if you're teaching five-year-olds or 15-year-olds or 25-year-olds, but actually let's make sure that everybody has the ability to be involved with their learning. And if, it, and if it, for example, you're, you're learning about the life of a camel, like what would we want to know about that camel? So pull the questions from the class. You know, some, some will have some basic knowledge and someone might say, what's the difference between a camel with one hump and two humps? That would be one discovery inquiry question. Someone might say, what do they eat? You know, what someone might say, do they really store water in the humps? And someone else will say, well, they only live in, you know, in Africa. And someone might go, well, I'm not sure that's true. And so you get all the questions together and then you start thinking about how would we divvy up those answers to the kids in the way they like to learn? So you could say, well, how could we find out these, the answers to these questions as a group? And someone might say, oh, we could go to the school library. And they say, well, who would like to go to the school library? And you might get two who say, yeah, I'd like to. So, right, well, that's your job. And someone else might say, well, I'll, I'll go to the zoo. This weekend I can go down and see the, the zookeeper who looks after the camels. And, and someone's like, oh, that's a great idea. Let's get a few of us and we'll go to the zoo this weekend and we'll find out in person. Someone else says, well, I can do the Google search. It's like, okay, you do that. And you might, you know, whatever ways it might be. Or someone says, oh, my neighbor, they love animals. I'm going to see what they know. And then you bring it back and suddenly you have students who have discovered the answers through a process that they chose, you know, this is a sort of a self-driven process of self-selection. I like to do it this way. And then collaborating back into a classroom where everyone is learning different ways and they can see the different types of learning that have come to bring it together. The great thing about that by having a few students in each group is they're also self-correcting. So if somebody comes up with a crazy idea that's saying, oh, there's a, there's a you know, type of camels that's got three legs, you're going to have someone go, actually, no, no, there's <laughs> not. <laughs> well, you try to find me the evidence of that, and they realize it's not true, which l- develops other skills as well around you know, fact-checking and actually saying, well, Facebook told me it's true. It's like, well, hang on, how do we know that that's true? You know, so, so you, have, you layer in all these learning opportunities into a session. And that can be done in almost any subject area at any age group. But it is about that facilitation that actually makes the learning a little more messy. You know, it's, it's not structured. It's not perfectly formed. But at the other end, if you talk to the students, they will remember every part of that process and they'll have the knowledge that they set out to discover in the first place. So as I was listening, I, I jotted down two words, or three words. The first one is two words as a phrase, is that learning opportunity. I've been proposing to people that our old vocabularies don't fit. So the idea of planning a lesson or planning instruction, uh, planning to observe, an administrator plan to observe instruction, those words don't seem to fit. It's It's really how does the teacher design a learning opportunity? So the driving word I use is that it's it's the student learning production behaviors. So it's what the student does that causes the learning outcome. So that the job of the teacher is to create that learning opportunity. Absolutely. And look, the learning opportunity starts by by putting your feet out of your bed in the morning onto the floor. You start another day of learning opportunity. And even between that process and getting to school, there are learning opportunities. You know, but actually it's about understanding that. that. Yeah, it is. It's about getting on your bike and, and cycling and meeting your friends and, you know, avoiding the dog on the road and stopping to buy something at the shop. All of those are, are parts of this learning. And I think that we need to move away from this idea that learning comes from a book or learning comes from these very structured lessons or they come from sitting exams because actually that's not learning. And in many cases like exams, you could argue that's memory only. And so for some people, that's wonderful. But for many, that actually is an immediate failure because they know that that's just not the way they learn. The other, the other word I jotted down was facilitation. Um, and I'm, <clears throat> I'm working with a district right now that is in the States that has actually dropped the word teacher 
out of the district vocabulary and put in facilitator. So the people nice. are called facilitators when they they write a note there. They talk about our facilitators, and uh, one of the uh, one of the uh, leaders in the district just wrote a blog that I'm uh, I'm going I'm going to be posting, and but I realize I'm going to have to put a, an explanatory sentence at the beginning because throughout her whole blog she's talking about what the facilitators are doing, and right. I, there'd be a bunch of people reading this not understanding that she's talking about what most people are calling the teacher in the classroom, but in in their work in that district they describe that role as facilitator. And look, there is a lot of ego attached to a term teacher. So I imagine it wouldn't be accepted by a lot of people saying, well, I I did all of the hard yards and heavy lifting to earn that degree as a teacher. And now a facilitator, is that that kind of, is not, is it taking away the prestige of being a teacher? But I think it's about relatability. I mean, if I look at job titles today across all sectors, they mean very different things. And people have got all sorts of new, wonderful job titles. And so I think Part of the problem when you have a, a term that is is basically been around for a long time, we, you know, we have these sort of general views of what we imagine a teacher to be, and actually, I think they have moved a long way away from that. You know, they teachers do far more than teach. You know, they they sure. are involved with you know the the mental health of their kids, the yep, physical exactly. health of their kids, their aspirations of what they want to become. You know, they they're guiding them. They, they you know they, they're you know, they're mentors, they, they do so many things. And in, in a way, it's selling them short by calling them a teacher, which, you know, suggests in the good old days, you stood in front of the blackboard and you you taught and, you know, yeah. and how to do arithmetic. So, you know, maybe it's time for a new name. The general, what you're saying, a facilitator to me is what they are. They're coaching, facilitating yeah. and bringing the best out of their students. And and I think it's it's a great privilege that we have people who want to do this. I mean, I'm I'm in awe of teachers. I mean, constantly that the, the work they do on so many levels, but actually the terminology is, is probably a, a little bit limiting to really yeah. the, the full scope of what they do. The facilitator, in, in my mind, facilitator is almost a promotion. <laughs> from, from <teaching. laughs> yeah, well, I guess it, it will come back to some people, I think, would see that differently. But Yeah, I'm, oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. That's what I'm saying. But, it, but it, it's almost like if as you move into a leadership role in any organization, you, you take on increasing facilitation mm. of uh, of the work that people are doing, rather than the actual uh, delivery of it, and that, that's that's how I it imagined in my head. It, there's a, a piece jumped out to me, and uh, you, you trigger me for my history. <laughs> but <laughs> way back way back when technology was was first beginning to show up in classrooms, I worked with the uh, with the dean of of a university who first started putting the phrase out to teachers that some teachers were being uh, were seeing themselves challenged by technology a sense that technology was taking their place and the 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 uh, the picture that he put in front of them was begin to consider technology as a uh, as as a co-teacher so if if the it's two are working side by side what are, what are the things that the technology can do that now free you up to take on this this other whole new role, and yeah. that 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 that's what I see people discovering as they move into that facilitator role. I used to yeah. have to deliver this knowledge to the kids, and now there's all these other places they can go get that. So that frees me up to step into this th- this next higher design level. Yeah, and look, I think that technology is no more taking a job away from a teacher than a giving a hammer to a to a builder is taking away <laughs> their skill. I mean, it's a tool. Technology is a, a tool of the 21st century, and it's a very useful tool because it actually enables us to do things that we could never do before, particularly around collaboration and sharing and, and backup and extension of learning. And you know, if you've got bright kids, they can go so much further if you give them scope to do that because they've got access to you know a very much a democratized education system globally now online. So it is a great tool, and we should never be fearful of something that actually makes our job easier and more time to be human and to provide that care and, and nurture and support for the students that we're there to teach. Which is the piece that technology is really bad at. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I place a lot of value on questions. So I'm wondering if, if you've got a thought about what are some questions teachers should be asking themselves as they, they look at uh, technology and learning and and then maybe there's some questions they should be asking kids. 
I think a question to ask kids is, as a teacher, a very brave teacher, I have to say, but a, a good teacher would be, what should I do less of? Mm. And actually, like but also explaining. So this is not a des- it's not designed to say less teaching. It, it's about letting the kids come forward and saying, well, these are the things that don't really work, or these. Are, and then, what should we do more of? Because actually, as a collective, then you start to get real insight of what's working and what's not. And then, what I always find when you you have these open ended questions is you discover a lot more than you, you you give credit to people for. I mean. I know that there's teachers I've talked to about this and they might be teaching eight-year-olds and they're saying, well, what does an eight-year-old really know about what they should do less of? And then they've come back and said, wow, actually, they're much more informed about how they learn and what the way they learn and when it's good and when it's not so good than I ever imagined. You know, there's an awareness of their own learning. And so I think it is about having the ability to have trust that it's not about always being right. You know, it's this idea that, even as a teacher or a parent, you have to be open to learning yourself because actually sometimes, you know, this idea of I have to be right is really self-limiting and it means you you don't have the chance to evolve over time and actually see that perhaps you've come stale in your practice and, and actually perhaps doing things that are almost on autopilot but are actually not that rewarding either for yourself as a teacher or for the students, because, you know, nothing on autopilot feels great. You know, it's just a process. It's, it's you know, re, um, rinse and repeat. And actually, you know, nobody wants to be there. So it's about saying, okay, why do I do it that way, knowing I'm not having great enjoyment doing this again and again? And what will I do differently? So turn that question back to the students and saying, what do you love and what should we do more of? Like, I like. It. So close us out here. I'm going to hit back to your technology futurist uh, t- title, uh, a, a, a picture that, uh, that teachers might be, uh, be pondering of, uh, of, of what could be down the road. Look, I think there is many new forms of learning that we're going to be facing. The one thing that COVID taught most of the world is that actually face-to-face learning is not the only way to learn. And we have now have developed different modalities and different styles and online is clearly going to be the winner. There's going to be a a lot more investment in types of online learning that moves far away from this idea of a Zoom call uh, or a Hangout. And actually, we will start to move increasingly into virtual worlds. We'll start to have groups that people can be uh, self-facilitating and self-forming groups where you'll start getting centers of excellence. And within classes, you might, instead of teaching all the kids at the same time at the same age group in the same year, I think there's going to be a move towards topics and subjects and people will self-select the level that they're at. And so you get that extension at the top, but you'd also get the chance to spend more time if you're you're not quite understanding it. You know, I've really struggled for a long time to understand why we teach every child who's 12 years old the same way when some of them, have really strong, they might be incredibly technical and mathematics and science comes naturally and they want to be extended. And yet you've got a whole bunch of people in the class who are really struggling to get the basic concepts. Online enables you to actually separate up by topics and levels. And we'll start to see specialists within the education system, even within, you know, within a school, we'll start having this ability to think about the individual student and where they fit as opposed to putting them all into the same class and saying, well, you were all born that year, so therefore you should all be learning in the same way. I'm, I'm kind of painting a picture in my mind of teachers working for a school could have very different roles, and, and kids may be working with several different teachers in combined roles. So I, I have an online, I have an online teacher facilitator that's working with me in this specialty area, while I still may be in this third grade classroom. And yeah, okay. then I have a special interest, so I'm working over here with that person. And those teachers together are, in effect, putting the, the, the student's educational plan forward. Yeah, and I think it could even be that they're out in different schools. Like, it could just be almost platforms yeah. where, you know, we know there are, there are rock star teachers and they can teach concepts so beautifully. And, you know, you might have a class online with 100 kids 
who are in that rock star teacher who's teaching chemistry because actually it's really hard to get good chemistry teachers, but that person is, is kind of what everybody goes to. But actually when it's in English, actually somebody is like really struggling and you have a sort of a, a class that is catch up on, in kind of key principles of English language or whatever it might be, and that has a, a smaller group of people who are working yeah. together. You know, I think that we'll start to understand that you don't have to have the system everyone moving through in the same way. And actually, as we better understand the mix between online and real life and blended learning, we'll start to get those benefits right across into our students. But I think it's the way that you think about adults, how we learn. We go and find the knowledge we need from the, from the personal place that suits us at the level that we're at. We do it all the time. So if I want to go and learn about quantum mechanics and I'm a beginner, I go and find a beginner class online of somebody who can teach me that. And I'm with people who are always also beginners. And I don't go in saying, excuse me, how old are you? <laughs> and, <laughs> is this the right class for me? So you know, we, we do it once we're out of the school system. You know, We literally match ourselves with what we need. We need to bring that back and have that ability without having to go into a private elite system in a public school system to be able to work in the same way and find the knowledge at the level where you start from so you can progress forward through the system and get the learning outcomes and the success that we all hope every single student will have. Well, Francis, I've really appreciated the, uh, the conversation with you. Could you take a moment and, and tell folks uh, how, how they can follow up and connect with you? Sure. You, you can find my website. So one is techfutureslab.com. And the other one is The Mind Lab, which is our main education site, themindlab.com. And then I'm available as Francis Valentine on LinkedIn or on Instagram. Thank you. And uh, I'll, I'll be sure to post that in the, in the lead into the podcast. Appreciate your time today and your thinking. Thanks, Steve. It's great to be here. Thanks for listening in, folks. I'd love to hear what you're pondering. You can find me on Twitter at Steve Barkley. Or send me your questions and find my videos and blogs at barclaypd.com.